All right. Well, welcome back from the break, everyone. Hopefully it was a good opportunity to chat with folks, get some food. Looks like we have some leftovers in case you want to take some for the road. Um, we're, again, um, so pleased that you're all here. And it's such a wonderful opportunity to be together in person for this event about the causes and consequences of January 6th for our democracy. From the perspective of those on the scene that day, um, as we heard from our brave officers, um, and in terms of um, our generous political scientists sharing their invigorating research on the event during the morning's roundtable. So my name is Katie Robidek. I'm a political theorist in the Department of Political Science at Hood College in Frederick, Maryland, which is just up the road. I have some of my wonderful students here from my Democratic Theory Seminar, and I know many other students are here as well who are interested in democracy and studying that at your institutions as well. So um, it's an honor to be moderating this panel of experts who are talking about perspectives on narrative and visual representations of January January 6th, um, and especially doing so in my role as the current chair of the Politics, Literature, and Film Organized Section for the American Political Science Association. Um, and our wonderful speakers on this afternoon's panel explore January 6th from some other perspectives than we've heard of um, this morning, like those of the protesters themselves, as well as the perspective of history, um, especially 19th century U.S. Reconstruction era history, and relatedly the perspective of US politics and the rhetoric of nostalgia. Um, so that longing for a past that was great that we heard so much about in these past few years. Um, so what I'm gonna do is some introductions of our panelists. They'll give their remarks in turn and then we'll have questions from our audience. So um, first, Dr. Greg Lasky is currently a fellow at the Newberry Library in Chicago. His co-edited volume called Democracies in America, keywords for the 19th century and today will be out this fall and I can't wait to get my hands on it um, for some of those resources that it contains for thinking about and talking about democracy, which is what we're doing here today, right? Um, Dr. Lasky will talk about how debates regarding January 6th relate to earlier debates in 19th century US history around reconstruction specifically, and we'll start us off, followed by Dr. Lily Gorin, professor of political science at Wisconsin's Carroll University, and also a former two-time chair of the politics, literature, and film organized section of the American Political Science Association. So I wanna recognize that work that she's done on behalf of the organization for many of us as a role model. Um, having co-edited with co-edited with Linda Beale, a 2015 book called Mad Men and Politics, Nostalgia and the Remaking of Modern America. She's well-placed to give remarks on how nostalgia, that longing for a great past, can be seen to dominate American politics and complicate political rhetoric as seen through the example of January 6th. Um, and third, joining us by, via Zoom, hopefully, um, once we get underway, Dr. Elizabeth Anker, who is Associate Professor of American Studies and Political Science at George Washington University here in DC, um, has a new book called Ugly Freedoms out this year, grappling with the complex legacy of freedom offered by liberal American democracy. And in that vein, she'll be talking to us about the protesters' own narratives of their participation in January 6th and its aftermath. So thank you so much to all of you for being here today and to our panelists, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Lasky. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. First of all, I want to say I'm thrilled to be here, but I'm not a political scientist. And I'm not a historian either. So um, don't hold either of those things against me or for me. But um, I want to thank all the organizers, Kara, John, all the wonderful people in Miami of Ohio who brought me here, Amanda, um, thanks to Lily and Katie. Uh, DC is my favorite city, I was telling a few people. So to be here is such a such a thrill in this wonderful conversation today. Um, so I think, am I ready to go? Okay, great. So I wanna just jump in and think about um, how the events of January 6th have occasioned comparisons to the US Civil War. And some evidence, which I'm sure none of us need to see here, but just to show how pervasive this trope of a new civil war has been in media coverage, in popular conversations of January 6th. Some of them are driven by the recent book by Barbara Walter, How Civil Wars Start, which I've not read yet. Maybe some of us here have it and can chime in with that contribution. But certainly not all of these headlines uh, have been driven by book reviews of Walter's book. In fact, the historical analogy between our 21st century US and the divided country of the years 1861 through 1865 wasn't spawned entirely by the anti-democratic insurrection of January 6th at all. 
For instance, some of you may know this December 19 special issue of the Atlantic Monthly, um, which bore as its title, How to Stop a Civil War. And if you haven't read this, um, since we're talking about civics education, I would just point out the brilliant essay by political theorist Danielle Allen that's in this special issue called The Road from Serfdom, How Americans Become Citizens Again. Just an amazing uh, talk about something that is prophetic and prescient and so important in so many ways. So it's freely available online. I recommend it to all, to everyone here, especially students. I think it's just such a powerful piece. And so even though Alan, I don't believe, embraces this term, the Civil War, I think that that analogy matters. And for all its problems, it works insofar as it broaches some fundamental questions that discussions of the Civil War and the discussions of January 6th hold in common. And that's fundamental questions about union and unity, the meaning of citizenship, dangers of factions and partisanship, and then most basically the meaning of liberty and equality, which are gonna be, depending on how you conjugate them at the heart of any definition of US democracy. And so with all that said, just wanna to ask today in the time I have about another historical reference point. And that's the period that followed the Civil War, Reconstruction. Commences officially in 1865, and it goes at least until the final decades of the 1800s, if not arguably well beyond. Now, my very unsystematic, admittedly, web searches, because there were so many Civil War headlines, I just you know, stipulated there are many of them. And I didn't do as systematic a search for Reconstruction, but Reconstruction as a term comes up much less often in the media coverage and representations of January 6th. And yet, as the wonderful historians Kate Mazur and Greg Downs wrote in this Washington Post op-ed from just days after the insurrection, the anti-democratic political violence of the Reconstruction era, which was a primary characteristic of that period, is a necessary lens for understanding the 6th of January and any conversation about who we as a nation, a collective identity, a union are. So I wanna ask and maybe invite us if we have time to think what can invoking reconstruction, not only the Civil War, teach us about January 6th? A few things. I think the first is for those of you who know the era, even in the North, in the reconstruction era, Political leaders, Congress people were themselves divided and conflicted about what Reconstruction meant. Was it on the one hand primarily about reunion and reconciliation, the ex Confederacy being reintegrated into the nation? Or on the other, was Reconstruction about a revolution, about a fundamental transformation of the meaning of US citizenship, setting the groundworks particularly for uh, the transition of ex enslaved people? to become truly freed people and included in, if not the law of citizenship, then at least the sort of symbolic trappings. Was it a revolution or was it about reconciliation? Doesn't have to be either or, but those two questions, our intention, were intention. And so I wanna just get at that by thinking about another R word. And that is a word that came up a lot in the reconstruction era and has come up also in our present, and that is the word revenge. This was a key term in Reconstruction debates about the aims of the project of post-Civil War US. And I think that tracking the language of revenge, how that word works in that era can also help us to understand a bit about how we might navigate our own post-January 6th moment. Okay, so almost immediately after the 1-6 insurrection, Republican politicians used the term revenge to denigrate efforts to punish all involved in treason, including Donald Trump. And so, for instance, on January 26, Senator Marco Rubio is referring to impeachment, and he says it's about demands for vengeance. I think he means demands for vengeance from the radical left. And in January 10th, uh, a CBS News story represented the insurrectionists as seeking vengeance. And I just want to play, if I may, just a quick clip from this video. Fingers crossed. Today, CBS News has learned the FBI arrested two men carrying plastic restraints into the Capitol.
One seen here is Eric Munchell. He was arrested in Nashville. CBS's Mark Strassman has the story. Vengeance is ours, saith the mob. And they're still saying. I'm really glad it needed to happen. Days after Magamania rampaged through an American sanctuary. Was the moment heroic or horrific? Partisans got in each other's face. Oh, oh and that's a familiar, too familiar partisan encounter. Um, but I just want to say in these two examples, Marco Rubio's tweet and this CBS News story, we're hearing echoes in small ways of the way revenge functioned in Reconstruction era debates. As in the Rubio example, revenge as a term was used to delegitimate what were legitimate calls for punishment of Confederate traitors. And revenge also worked uh, in, a, in a partisan way uh, from Northern Democrats and also the white South to critique, is putting it too lightly, but to basically speak against any sort of attempts to enfranchise black Americans. If you look at newspapers, you see all these claims about Northern revenge, um, supposedly against the South. Take for instance, this paper, this is a 1867 Memphis newspaper talking about military control of the South and black enfranchisement as policy. And it states in amazement that the leaders of the North could be willing to ruin their own country in order to wreak their revenge on us. And so that white Southern view of Reconstruction ultimately won the day. The, the idea that Reconstruction was the North's revenge against the South came to, was enshrined in textbooks. It's central to the lost cause lie of the Confederacy. It'd be interesting to hear from the morning's panel um, when the big lie as a term came into historical circulation. I don't know the answer to that. So in that story, in this story, the white South claimed itself as the aggrieved party, the wronged party. And I think that's not too dissimilar from the way the CBS News story arguably frames the mob seeking vengeance as, um, well, there's a lot we could say about that, but I think that there's some similarities to explore there. And so to conclude, I just wanna ask us to take stock of what's going on with this historical repetition, echoes of revenge from the past into the present. But before I close, I want to say that there's another, there's not the only, this is not the only story of revenge that emerged from the Reconstruction era. It's just the one that's most familiar to us because of really the lost cause way of writing history. Um, but the other way of talking about revenge from the Reconstruction era is something that we've pretty much forgotten. And that version of revenge, that definition of vengeance actually supported democratic reforms. It supported the work of racial justice, of liberty and equality for all. It's what Republican Senator Charles Sumner said in 1865 when he announced on slavery, let vengeance fall. Thinking about taking revenge against an institution, wiping out an institution by bringing vengeance upon it. Sumner, like people such as Frederick Douglass and others, understood that version of Reconstruction as a way to break down one order and to construct another, to build a U.S. democracy that, yes, maybe required justified revenge, but only in order to right national wrongs. And so in the wake of January 6th, we are living in an era that some have called a third Reconstruction, and that turn of phrase brings our 21st century into dialogue with the first reconstruction of the 1800s, and also the second reconstruction of the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century. So to end with a question, if we do consider this a useful concept of the present as third reconstruction, then how do we respond to two at least competing imperatives that are not dissimilar from the reconstruction era US? On the one hand, the need to forge national union I don't mean to suggest that reunion and union and reconciliation are unimportant things. They're not. On the other hand, how does one maintain a commitment to multiracial democracy, to liberty and equality for all? And those two stories can be told through the way revenge worked in the Reconstruction era. And so our answer will necessarily differ from those answers given during the first Reconstruction. But I think we should keep this earlier history in mind, um, if only to keep that first reconstruction from giving us only the worst kind of revenge in our present. Thank you.
Nancy hates the green. I sent them to you. I did. You, you opened them before. Thank you um, to all of our hosting institutions. I really appreciate it. And I'm delighted to see so many students here and thank you especially to Katie um, for inviting me and my colleagues to participate in this panel discussion. Um, and, and we start uh, from making America great again, um, which is by definition, a call of nostalgic longing for a previously great past. Um, the events, the words, um, and the symbols um, of the Trump movement uh, are, are also, you know, the sort of symbols that we understand from the January 6th insurrection as well. Um, and they, they all elucidate this sort of constant nostalgia that has dominated American culture um, and is particularly acute right now on the right. The images, costumes, words, and symbols of January 6th all wove together a nostalgia with a radical, violent, and disjunctive political event. Um, and I'm examining how the constancy of nostalgia has often complicated political rhetoric and political imagination in the United States and how the particular political and rhetorical path that led us to 1-6 moved along an avenue of both nationalism, perhaps particularly of white Christian nationalism, and nostalgic yearning combined with a narrative about what the United States is and how it is supposed to be, and who, of course, is an American. Um, and, and so the January 6th images and rhetoric were about stopping the steal of the presidential election and taking our country back, as in wrenching it away from those who inappropriately or illegally hold it. Um, it is also about stopping the country from being stolen from those who have more right to the nation. And that was part of the discussion that we also had this morning. And taking the country back is not only about taking it back in this particular instance on January 6th, but taking it back to a mythical place of wholeness. Um, these calls and demands of 1-6 connect directly to the original rallying cry of the Trump campaign in 2016. Um, and the term that has become part of our vernacular, MAGA, make our country great again. Make our country, make America great again. It is the again that draws our attention. That is an expansive nostalgic call for return to a once greater past. Taking our country back as articulated on January 6th, builds on the same nostalgic call, the past that has apparently been lost. To MAGA chants at rallies and proud wearing of these actually made in China hats, um, indicating that Americans coalesced around the idea that not only was America not great um, in 2016 or in, in the recent past, but that a reality television star and thrice married New Yorker could lead the country to halcyon days once again. This is not news to anybody. Um, <clears throat> the again part has always been the most complicating aspect of this nostalgic yearning to a time perhaps when, quote, uppity black athletes, unquote, knew their place and didn't kneel during the national anthem or march in the streets to a time when women knew their place and didn't run for president or really anything at all, and certainly didn't complain about sexual assault 
to a time when transgender soldiers were not serving openly in the military, um, <clears throat> and to a time when bakeries were not even asked to bake wedding cakes for same-sex couples because same-sex couples couldn't marry. Uh, Make America Great Again is referenced possibly also to a time when the police were not questions about the actions they take, especially in regard to non-white citizens. Is the taking our country back about a time when men had one career and one job for the span of their working life? Or is it to a time when there seemed to be a stability and order to life, one not constantly in flux and rocked by disasters or global pandemics, protest march or police shootings? Or is it about the role of the United States as the dominant international force for good through an unparalleled military and vast economic wealth? The again, in making America great again, the taking our country back um, is the complicated understanding of a nation that has remade itself on a number of occasions both in a romantic attachment to a mystical past and the constantly promising horizon of the United States. Um, Zbine Zilke, an expert on nostalgia, explains that couched between the discursive reaffirmation and attempted recreation of a historical past and a longing for a future that fulfills the promise of American ideals, America's self-conception can be conceived of as an effect of nostalgia that is future-oriented just to complicate matters. <laughs> um, Trump, in defining his campaigns and his approach to the presidency, presidency with these clarion calls of making America great again and taking the country back, fit these narratives squarely into a comfortable and actually quite acceptable space for many Americans. The events leading up to January 6th, the insurrection on that day, and the dialogue that has followed as we digest the differing interpretations of 1-6 are tied directly to this mythical notion of the United States, which connects a nostalgic yearning, nationalism, and future orientation. To make America great again, to take America back, of course, means to determine what it made it great initially. Um, this narrative construction is, in many ways, the narrative history of the country, and it is also the narrative we see regularly in cultural artifacts from literature to television shows to comic books to video games. As I'm in the midst of working on a book on the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I can tell you it's all over the place. Um, it is a historical approach to an effective sense you know, something that we feel, a conjuring of history and longing that is as dependent on actual facts that is, as it is dependent on the visual artifacts that cement the feelings and senses of heroic past periods, be they reconstruction or the defeat of Nazis in, um, in Europe. Thus, when we think about the history and the myths that define the United States, these are braided ideas of the creation myths of foundings and refoundings, for those of us who study um, political theory, um, <laughs> punctuated in many cases by acts of violence. The 1776 revolution, the Civil War, the demonstration and the riots of the 1960s, and by this, this act of violence um, just over a year ago, all predicated themselves on purifying the nation once again, taking it back with strength, as President Trump said on the ellipse that morning, from those who were seen as imposters or weak, noting to the crowd that you'll never take our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. Um, <clears throat> nostalgia itself is multifaceted um, in its political uses, coming through overt electoral politics and referenda, as well as cultural narratives and popular portrayals. The current climate in the United States reflects another wave of this kind of connection. And as in previous periods, the use of anger and fear has been directly connected to a nostalgic reinterpretation of a non-existent past. Arguments for a better future rest on somehow grasping a national past that may smooth out the shocks of globalization, technological innovation, a worldwide pandemic, shifting racial, ethnic, and religious demographics. There is a layered nostalgia 
um, that is directly connected to a form or kind of American nationalism. And that the nostalgia and nationalism are braided together, which is also what we see in our contemporary politics and which was very much present on January 6th and leading up to it. Understanding these tensions and responses as observed in contemporary electoral politics and within popular culture, which is why Tony Soprano is up there, um, as is Captain America, helps to elucidate the complex narrative that combines an embedded nationalistic longing with a subsumed understanding of nostalgic heroics and nationalistic glory. We see this in the approach to 1-6 before the violence at the Capitol, as President Trump explained to the crowd that day, and we fight, we fight like hell. And if we don't fight like hell, you're not gonna have a country anymore. We also see the same narrative of nostalgic heroics and nationalistic glory woven into so much popular culture, from Marvel superheroes to the antiheroes of The Sopranos, The Wire, Mad Men, and the heroics of most police procedurals that you see on television any night you turn on the set or stream it. Um, nostalgia is not merely the concept of sepia-toned images and thinking about a nice memory. Nostalgia was initially considered a disease connected to melancholy since it debilitated individuals, but it is now understood as a part of effective as with is engaging emotions, politics, and often contributes to individuals and national conceptualizations to understand embedded connections that may lead more fully to the way that the past is recollected and how the impacts, the nostalgic understandings of self and nation work. Svetlana Bohm, who is another expert on nostalgia, explains that nostalgia is a sentiment of loss and displacement but it is also a romance with one's own fantasy. Bohm also connects the personal approach to politics and nostalgia, noting that nostalgia is about the relationship between individual biography and the biography of groups or nations between personal and collective memory. This toggling between the personal and the political is also where the individual's consumption of cultural artifacts, of political narratives, that re-embed ideas and images from particular times with historical verisimilitude become more problematic and lead us to divergent interpretations of the events of 1-6. So it's not only about the events themselves, but how we recollect them, how we discuss them. We all talked about this this morning as well. Were those who stormed the Capitol insurrectionists attempting to disrupt the constitutionally prescribed order of events and the peaceful transfer of power? Or were they brave patriots aiming to stymie a fraudulent political process? This connection between the individual biography and the biography of the nation, the personal and the collective memory bear directly on these competing narratives. This is not only about the embedded nostalgia that came before the events of 1-6, but also in the time since the events of that day, the narrative that has grown up around the events themselves and in our collective and divergent understandings of 1-6. As Machiavelli reminds us, um, and you know, we do have some political theorists at the table, um, <laughs> republics require founding myths, in part because they provide the basis for the shared connection of, to the republic. Our nation has been founded and refounded many times, and in this regard, the call back to another time, another era is not new. But what is unique in the rhetoric and imagery that surround 1-6 is that there are calls back to different foundings or different interpretations of American foundings, to the original founding of North America by Europeans, which of course undermines and abrogates the history and reality of indigenous people in North America, um, to the revolutionary period, to the Civil War. But the images that we saw on 1-6 were not to the Union but to the Confederacy instead of the Union with the Confederate flag waving in the Capitol for the first time ever, to World War II, but again to the Third Reich with swastikas emblazoned on clothing and Camp Auschwitz t-shirts or sweatshirts. Um, the foundings references throughout 1-6 are muddled. Foundings are important to national identity and the American founding is particularly important in our understanding of the form and shape not only of American politics and culture, 
but the narrative discussions of those and the way that those concepts are also entangled, entangled with both nostalgia and nationalistic impulses. Within this context, the political understanding of nostalgia is connected to emotional impulses. Thus, as an emotion, nostalgia furthermore suggests that someone is acting emotionally and hence not rationally. If nostalgic impulses or considerations are effective, and if we can examine these impulses as we might see connections to the heroic narratives that are often available and even embedded within our cultural understandings, this longing can be coupled with the myriad kinds of anxiety that many citizens acknowledge feeling and may be at the root of their electoral choices. But if political nostalgia is linked together with anxiety to try to assuage those anxieties, it is not necessarily to return to the frontier per se or to fight on the beaches of Normandy, but the desire to recall and engage with heroic narrative is both satisfying and can lead to nostalgic yearnings for this kind of nationalism. According to the analysis by the Washington Post, references to the year 1776 and the American Revolution have grown substantially among the far right. Trump allies and surrogates referred to January 6 as Republicans, quote, 1776 moment. Thus, a call to disrupt a political process with violence is situated in performative nationalism, which can be seen in so many of the symbols and clothing choices of the 1-6 insurrectionist the, and nostalgic impulses to return to a once greater past to set the ship of state right again. Hey, Libby. Hi, can everybody see me? <laughs> Great, and um, I, I don't think I can hear you very well, but hopefully you can hear me. And if we need to, during Q&A, we can um, uh, figure something out. Um, I am really delighted to be here today. I very much wish that I could be in the room with all of you and with my colleagues, um, but I'm really grateful that we have found a way to make a virtual engagement work. Um, so thank you very much for having me um, and for having me on this panel. So I, um, like my fellow panelists, will be talking about some of the, the, the rhetoric and the ideas that were circulating by the rioters. Uh, while storming the steps of the U.S. Capitol last year, one particularly enthusiastic writer, Nathan Entrican, declared, I am here for freedom. Now, this would seem an odd declaration, since freedom is typically considered the highest ideal in U.S. politics. It's a righteous value that opposes tyranny and coercion. If this man used freedom to describe his participation in efforts to violently overturn a democratic election, hurt and harm the people protecting the Capitol, and possibly hang the vice president, right? The, the insurrectionists or rioters tried to subjugate democratic institutions and force other Americans to submit to their desire for a second Trump presidency. So how could this be freedom? But I think if we scratch beneath the surface, more is going on here. First, the rioter likely means the freedom to choose one's leaders right, if he believes, however incorrectly, that the election was stolen. He also means the freedom of independence against state tyranny if he believes that the government has usurped his basic power to make, you know, decide on an election or make life choices. And even if we might disagree about whether that applies, this is certainly a pretty common definition of political freedom. It even echoes claims made in the Declaration of Independence. So while it might be easy to argue that this man's actions in no way reflect freedom, and in many ways they might oppose freedom's ideals, I think he's showing us something more complex. At a basic level, he draws on freedoms that are important to many, if not most Americans. But perhaps more importantly, he is disclosing an unsavory and disturbing truth. So I think this rioter shows us a larger problem right now in American politics, which is that these days popular uses of freedom entail not merely celebrated actions of uncoerced action or rule of law, but they also entail freedom practiced as subjugation and domination. We can see values of freedom justifying domination in many places in US politics today. Across the country, there are new laws for education freedom that outlaw discussions of racism and sexuality in classrooms. We know uh, congressional leaders have created a freedom caucus and many of its members tried to assist Donald Trump in overturning the 2020 election. 
Anti-vaccination movements for health freedom assert that vaccinating communities or wearing masks to protect the immunocompromised or vulnerable members of our community is an action that limits their personal freedom of choice to put cloth in front of their face. Each of these actions uses freedom to justify harming other people or narrowing the scope of democracy. So these freedoms, like our rioters' use of freedom, go against many foundational assumptions in American politics. We often presume freedom goes hand in hand in democracy, like when we say that our politics are free and democratic. We also insist that one person's freedom can never harm or injure another person. In fact, we consider that to be oppression, the very opposite of freedom. For most Americans, freedom is something that brings all citizens together. It unites us in a shared cause. And this is exactly the community that the Declaration of Independence calls on when it creates a new political order by and for people who insist that everyone is inalienably, inalienably endowed with liberty. Right? These are the political stories we tell about freedom, the values that we learn in our history texts and in our political theory classrooms, the songs that we sing at sports events, the assertions repeated daily in our news media. Right? These are a foundational part of our political culture. Yet what we're seeing today, what the rioter discloses to us, is something quite different. Here, freedom entails overturning democratic processes, suppressing education about race and sexuality, cutting needed services for vulnerable Americans, and neglecting community health. So what the rioter's use of freedom in this context shows us is not that he is misunderstanding freedom or even just cynically using the language of freedom to justify his violence. He's revealing instead the increasing popularity of a type of freedom that is not expansive, but is exclusionary and coercive. He's showing us the rising popularity of a type of freedom that does not, com um, does not combat domination, but actually fosters it. So this type of freedom is not new to our moment, even though it's increasing in popularity. We can see it in early American history when claim for slaveholders' freedoms of property justified black slavery. I write about that a little bit in my new book, Ugly Freedoms. Uh, we also know that for much of American history, freedom justified domestic violence, as up into the 20th century, husbands had the freedom of authority to beat and harm their wives and control their finances. And yet because this problem of ways in which freedom justifies violence was never reckoned with that seriously in the past, Today, it's reappeared with a vengeance in new and unprecedented ways. We see a growing number of laws, caucuses, rallies, and movements using the language of freedom as a cudgel to erode democratic governance, harm vulnerable Americans, and undermine civil rights. So how do we deal with these harmful freedoms? Right? As we know, Americans talk about freedom all the time. It's, it is oftentimes a core, if not the core, American political ideal. But few of us often know how to oppose others' uses of the terms when we disagree, in part because we presume that freedom is always an ideal. Yet I think we're wrong when we presume that freedom is always and only an ideal. If freedom's always ideal, then how do we challenge the writer's claim that freedom motivated him to invade the Capitol? Right? The answer is obviously not to just accept what he's saying and move on. But I also don't think the answer is just to say that he's wrong in how he uses freedom, that he's incorrectly using a hallowed ideal. Because the problem here isn't that this is a false or fake freedom. As difficult as it is to admit, his declaration of freedom isn't unfounded because freedom has been used to oppress others at other moments in American history. And there's many more examples than even the ones that I cited. The real problem here is what his practice of freedom entails. The problem is that his freedom thwarts democracy, tries to monopolize political power, and it hurts other people. So rather than calling his freedom mistaken or dumb, a better approach is to critically interrogate it. Does his practice of freedom impair other people or boost their ability to craft their own futures? Does his practice of freedom promote or prevent discrimination? Does it support or dismantle democracy? Questions like these are crucial because they help us to judge the use and the effects of freedom. In order to address the rhetorical appeal of the Capitol rioters and their beliefs that they are acting in the name of freedom, I think um, all Americans need to upend our reflexive assumptions about this core American value and make it open for criticism. I think we need to stop suggesting or believing that freedom is always unchallengeable and also stop claiming that anything we disagree with 
isn't a real freedom, right? The problem is not that it's not real. The problem is the damage that it can do. We need to accept that freedom has in fact produced damage and violence in the past, because only when we accept these problems can we address them right now, we can both stop the use of freedom to justify domination, while also articulating more kind of powerful and inclusive freedoms. Freedoms that uphold truly fair and equal visions that support democracy, support an inclusive society, and support every individual's right to live a flourishing life. This is the question, and these are the sorts of questions we need to confront the rioter with. And I think anyone today who states that their actions are justifying freedom, these are the questions we need to ask. Fundamentally, they boil down to one. Does this freedom weaken or support other people's ability to live a flourishing life? The Capitol rioter shows us that we need to make freedom political again. We need to make it challengeable, debatable, something that we argue over and don't just merely accept whenever someone throws it down to justify their actions. The rioter shows us the dire importance that I think faces all of us, which is articulating and standing up for a democratic language of freedom that challenges situations where some Americans have undue power over others and that support freedoms that grant all citizens equal access to governing power. Because if one person has more power than another, then nobody can ever be free. The politics of this approach therefore don't revolve around finding a middle position between two opposing ideals of freedom because that might entail limiting some people's freedoms so that other people feel satisfied. And I don't think that this is a viable or fair approach. What I'm asking from us instead is to articulate and fight for a more robust and inclusive freedom that supports the lives of all people, not just some. So I'll end by saying that standing for these alternative freedoms gives us the tools to evaluate any freedom claim. Does this freedom injure others or help them thrive? And does it expand or contract people's ability to participate equally in the governing decisions that shape their lives? These kinds of questions give us the information and the confidence to challenge the violence of freedom and to construct and uphold freedoms that enable more people to live a flourishing and empowered life. The Capitol rioters' freedom, as we know, does neither, and we all deserve better. Thank you. And anchor. Um, I know there's probably a lot of questions as we think about making freedom political again. We heard that in our previous speakers, uh, January 6th as a political event, right? So talking about the politics and the symbols and the different narratives around this event um, becomes something that is actually a democratic act. What we're doing in this room is democratic, right? We're talking about the politics of this event and its meaning for various people. Um, and so with that, I'd like to just open the floor to any questions that you have. Three at the same time. <laughs> um, we'll go clock clockwise, Dr. Bell and Kyra. Um, okay, well, this is not particularly well thought out, but I was I was thinking about Lizzie's comments about this notion of sort of freedom or, or the concept of freedom being used really as a bludgeon to restrict people's liberties. Um, and so sort of pushing back against the critique that I got when I said, you know, this is a theory paper. Uh, so what what do we do about that, right? I mean, I'm in Virginia, I'm looking at what's happening in the state legislature and, and efforts. Um, by our new governor to, to try to restrict, he sort of won his, his office on the basis of saying that we've got to change what our school boards are doing and restrict critical race theory. Um, and so, so what is the answer to that, right? Because it, it feels as though almost like a new weapon has been unleashed in the political discourse. And I worry that, that both parties um, will seek to use that to their own advantage. And so I, I guess I wonder if you have any perspectives on what do we do now that that sort of become this new weapon? I have all the answers. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I I think that's a, that is a very, very important question. And maybe one that I'll say, you know, when people, 
part of what Yunkin is arguing, and we see with other governors and other state legislatures arguing, is that the freedom to restrict education in the classroom is, is parental freedom, right? It's parental rights to be able to decide what happens in a classroom. And sometimes I see when people are trying to argue something different that they're still stepping away from the question of freedom. It's almost as if they're granting like, okay, wow, that is the parent's freedom. And then maybe they'll address it on another realm. But I think bringing the fight to freedom itself can be really important in, in the sense of saying, if this is a parental freedom, on the one hand, what are its effects? And what about the freedom of educators? What about the freedom of students to learn? What about the freedom of community members? to you know to be part of a community that accurately assesses its history. So I think rather than shying away from the language of freedom and trying to argue based on other values, which can certainly be important, but I, I think facing the and, and re-articulating the language of freedom in a way where it's looked at more holistically and the way in which we say, right, we don't just give up when somebody says this is a freedom or this is a right, but you actually spin out what are the effects of that? Why should someone's right be to severely limit the education of a community? Or why should someone's right you know, be to then harm teachers, which is exactly what happens because so many of these things are punitive in, in the way in which they harm teachers, the way they criminalize teachers. So you know, I, I think that's, that's part of at least, I think the rhetorical approach to challenging it is to keep it on that terrain of freedom, but to articulate it in, in different and, and more bold ways. Last week in my um, philosophy and civic life class with Dr. Katie, we were talking about this idea of nostalgia and how that applies to the nonprofit sector. And somebody had said, um, I think it might have been me, had said something along the lines of people of privilege get to experience nostalgia in a different way. So they can look back and see all the positive things and not see, you know, the negative aspects. And we were talking about how um, that applied to January 6th. So I just wanted to know your perspective on that. Absolutely, 100%. That that the the nostalgic yearning to a particular idealized past is one that is experienced much differently from people who have the privilege and protection of thinking about a past where um, you know there was one breadwinner, say, and you know the 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 woman stayed home and took care of the kids and. They had a house and a picket fence, right? This is like believe it to beaver nostalgia that we've been living in um, for decades now. Um, but of course, what does that blank out? That blanks out the fact that that woman was having a nervous breakdown because she was bored out of her mind. <laughs> that that blanks out the fact that she was assisted by probably a black housekeeper um, who you know doesn't have the same kind of nostalgic feelings or retrospective imagining of that particular time. Obviously it blanks out anybody who was not cis and heterosexual um, from the whole equation. And so nostalgia is, is, is a part of effective politics because it, it sort of plays on this idealized notion for the various people who may want to re-establish or sort of establish again that kind of idealized past, which is why Make America Great Again, I think is so, is, is so dangerous in a certain sense in terms of our understanding is like, what's the reference point to be again? Like, what are we making it great again from to? Um, and for whom, right? And that a lot of what I think you see in terms of the demonstration on January 6th and again in the nostalgic recollection of what January 6th was and what it was about um, is, is also on that same plane. Um, that, you know, I, there's a lot with regard to the understanding of who was involved in January 6th, as we had discussion this morning, is you know vast majority 
of men and white men, and I'm going to assume, but I could be wrong, straight white men, um, that, that this is, again, getting at this kind of anxiety that a lot of white men seem to be experiencing in terms of displaced power, displaced economics. Um, and so there's this recollection for a once great past. Um, and, and I think that both, both the narrative of making America great again and taking the state back by force are, are the same, are pieces of the same puzzle in terms of that nostalgic recollection. So you're absolutely right to ask like, does somebody have a better past that they wanna go back to um, mm -hmm. that isn't the same for everybody because nostalgia is very much in that zone. It's whose nostalgic yearning you're sort of treading upon. Thank you for the question. Thank you. So my, my question is gonna kind of address the uh, freedom aspect again, and also revenge. Um, I would like to kind of imagine current American politics and the divisive nature of it as kind of trench warfare in that there's kind of no man's land. And it's hard to reach across the aisle. Uh, with the sense of revenge that either side might feel towards the other, how can we have that talk about freedom? How can we reach across the aisle without metaphorically getting shot for it? <laughs> I go first. Oh, I'm going first. <laughs> um, it's a great question. And it's a hard question because, you know, not only are we in such a polarized moment right now, and I think that that's, you know, uh, that, that is certainly damaging for democracy in many ways, but I also feel like when we meet at a midpoint, part of what because so many of our polarizations are basically about who has rights, whose lives matter more, um, you know, uh, what kind of family structure is allowed to be okay and which one is denigrated. So sometimes when we meet in the middle, what we're doing is saying that the people whose lives are being kind of harmed or injured or discriminated against, that they have to give up wanting to have a full life in order to meet people in the middle. And that that is something that I worry about. So. Um, you know, when we can, I think, when there are spaces where people can actually talk and, and learn from one another without the kind of heated anger and recrimination, I think that people can start to understand other people and become more open and accepting of difference and diversity. But I think, so, so maybe part of the challenge is not to find a midway point, but at least to find spaces where people can become more open to learning about other people's lives and experiences and not trying to demonize them or take away their rights or limit them from the full expression of what makes their lives a flourishing life. Because I think when we look at freedom as the capacity to live a flourishing life, it's hard to compromise on that to, to, when you're compromising with one side that says your lives matter less. That I think, it, it, you know, th that makes a, a midway point more difficult but I do think talking without recrimination and under and talking with understanding can do some of the work to to the recognition that all people deserve a flourishing life and that what people understand to be flourishing might be different from what your own values are, your nostalgia for what America might be or should have been. But that doesn't mean that their lives aren't worthy and deserving of the utmost of respect and their capacity to um, to, to live it in the way that they choose. Yeah, so I, I it's a it's a great question. I totally agree with everything we said. One of the tricky things about reconstruction for me and thinking about that as a historical analogy is it was, it was an incredibly partisan period. And most of what we would take, I'm using we, you know, in a tentative way, I, mean, I would say most of us probably think that a lot of what was accomplished by reconstruction today, we just take for granted, right? The, the civil war amendments. Um, and so how do you, think about this question of partisanship, which is clearly a problem, which is clearly, you know, almost a problem that is, how do you move forward, right? On the other hand, um, the example of reconstruction is, 
that a lot of democratic, small d democratic stuff came from a divisive partisan and in many ways, people from the white South thought it was unconstitutional because there was no constitutional representation. So I think the, um, the, the, the question maybe is, is democracy, right? How, which is a term that has been debated for years, your students know probably for thousands of years, but I mean, has anyone have a conversation where they're talking to someone they're like, oh yeah, that's democratic. And the person sort of has a, the total opposite definition of democracy and you're having the same conversation, but not having the same conversation, right? Or, you know, one thing I hear a lot is, oh, but it's not even a democracy, it's a republic, right? So there's this sort of, there's this sort of initial roadblock, right, to conversation. And, you know, you, we don't need the same definitions, right? That would be, that would be anti-democratic, but we do need some way to think more, I mean, your example, Lily, of symbols, right? And how symbols get reappropriated and defined differently. There needs to be a way, I think, to have some meeting point. I think this is what Libby's talking about, some meeting point that is not a renunciation of one's own commitments or commitments to what you are holding as democratic. So I, I don't, I guess that's a long way of saying I'm not sure. But I want to say I love, <laughs> was, it, was it Leah's comment about nonpartisanship as a practice? I thought that was such an amazing turn of phrase. And I want to think more about that um, because I think that's 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 what we need historically though i'm aware of how partisanship was a a useful practice too and it just may be that you know at certain historical moments we need different resources and different practices and certainly nonpartisanship is one of them right now um this is one for dr anchor uh it's not your job i don't think uh to help the democrats tall be uh, when, but I was thinking of what Terry McAuliffe was vilified for saying uh, that, and I don't know if I have the quote right, that he didn't think that parents should get to tell educators what to teach. And I just wonder what you think about that as a rhetorical response and what, what might have been a more inclusive response or something that might have spoken to what you, you've been talking about. Um, thanks for that. Um, it's a, you know, it, it's an interesting question. Um, and I also, I just want to just echo one prior comment about nonpartisanship, although I didn't hear the beginning of it, but I do think we also, when we're thinking about questions of freedom, it, it does need to be nonpartisan because I don't think one party has a sole claim on what freedom is. I think freedom has to be, you know, when, when you're talking about freedom, every single freedom claim, no matter who says it has to be adjudicated for whether or not the freedoms that are being upheld are freedoms that allow for the flourishing of all people rather than some. And so I wonder, you know, just thinking about that for someone like McAuliffe, if the claim is not that what parents can't do, but what teachers and community members and students should also be allowed to do, I think that somewhat broadens the conversation because then it's not saying, to, you know, parents should have no say over the development of their children, but it is also saying that part of what we have in a, in a world where we educate our students publicly is that a public also has a say. It means a teacher also has a say and it means students have a say, right? Students are articulate enough. I mean, any of us who have kids knows, right? By the time your kids are in pre-K or kindergarten, they also have a sense of what they want and what they wanna learn. And they're really interested in questions of fairness and justice all the time. Kids are ready for big conversations and they enjoy them. I think it gives them pride. And so, and a sense of accomplishment. So talking about what everyone needs, not just how we limit people's rights, I think can, can rhetorically do different work at least. So I, I'm not sure that entirely answered your question, but you know, that might be one suggestion I would have for Terry McAuliffe. <laughs> Thank you. It's a question of the nostalgia issue. Um, and so, my work is in small business, uh, in small business in the 19th century. Um, and so, you know, sometimes I often think about, you know, nostalgia as being um, uh, the better part of frustration, you know, and uh, in, in that idea that, you know, while, you know, you're limiting social mobility, you're clearly, you know, there's a, uh, an issue of, um, you know, uh, economic mobility as well. And so you see this play out in the 19th century when um, small business used to offer the pathway to bigger and better things. 
Uh, and then that falls away with the, you know, the increasing culturization of, I don't know, everything. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering, like, you know, are we in a moment, do you see where you see some similar pattern here? You know, you have this massive shift to tech, uh, high education necessary to gain momentum. And, you know, the demographic of, you know, what, what you see as the core of some of these, you know, and I'll use the generous term protest groups, um, <laughs> uh, you know, are made up by, you know, obviously men who are, are kind of, you know, caught up in this toxic masculinity, but then there's also, it seems to me that there's a core of them that is, who are, you know, individuals who don't perhaps see the path to the next level, to the next step. It's, I, I guess I'm just part comment, part like, ah, what do you think, you know? Uh, is there an element of that uh, here, do you think? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I mean, again, it, this was one of the discussions that happened in political science and among economists after 2016, is that the average Trump voter or somebody who makes thousand dollars or more right um or around there uh and so the the idea that the the trump voter is somebody who is a um lower middle class lunch bucket person doesn't square necessarily with the people who voted for donald trump and i would say probably the same thing about the the insurrectionists is that the people who made their way to Washington DC from Ohio and California and Nebraska and Virginia had the capacity to do so. Um, and, and so that the, the economic dimension of who is involved in these protests, um, while populist in terminology may not be economically populist. And I think that part of, you know, sort of what we're talking about here, and this goes to, the presentation on toxic masculinity and the origins of it is that the many of the white men, and they are white Christian men, I think mostly, um, gets into the space of not necessarily being economically disadvantaged, but feeling disadvantaged, mm -hmm. and that other people are advantaged, and that the the nostalgia is for a time when not that person, maybe not that person had this advantage, but that people like them had the advantage, had the access. Um, and, and so that, you know, again, this goes to globalization. Um, this goes to, you know, sometimes the, the conspiracy narratives about international organizations are in charge of things. Um, that was also part of the narrative that say the John Birchers had, um, that you, you sort of see this understanding of like, people like me, where's my place in the world? In, in this country, which, you know, I've had many students tell me that the United States is a Christian country. And mm -hmm. I asked them for the reference to Jesus and the constitution hard to find <laughs> um it yes the majority of people in the united states are in fact christian that is true um but the sort of understanding of like what does my place look like and what did it look like what do i think it looked like is where you get into this sort of nostalgic yearning i think that's kind of my answer to your comment slash question <laughs> thank you Thank you all so much for, um, for presenting and sharing your, your work. Um, one of the things that has struck me this year is um, Song Kwame Jeffries made a really important point that if he did, would have done a, a better job of teaching about the Colfax murders, we wouldn't have had January 6th. I also had a student last semester make the point in a class that if higher education doesn't do something about diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-racism, anti-discrimination, anti-oppression in our curriculum, we are responsible for the next January 6th. 
um, mm -hmm. in thinking about the Colfax murders and the way it's memorialized, <laughs> um, in shifting responsibility away from the white men who, um, who murdered the black men, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I wonder what your thoughts are in terms of this moment right now, um, in terms of how we are both capturing and teaching about the symbols of this moment for generations moving forward, and what the implications are for democratic practice and institution. I think it's you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that's where I think some of my comments about how January 6th being nostalgically interpreted at this point. And, and I, would, I would say what um, I, would, I would sort of comment that the police officers who sat here and eloquently told their story about accountability is really where we sort of are sitting in terms of what happens to the people who participated in an in insurrection. If you can go home and, you know, and first of all, you maybe never get charged with anything, or if you do get charged with something, it's very low level because the attempt is to hire and hire. Um, what does that mean with regard to the not only one six, but these kinds of attempts of political violence? I mean, I understand there was complications with regard to the FBI involvement in the mayor, or excuse me, the governor of Michigan's kidnapping. But if you plan to kidnap a governor of a state and then there is nothing that happens to you, what happens to the next person who plans to kidnap a governor mm -hmm. of the state? Um, and that becomes the difficulty with these sort of forms of political violence because they're all predicated on a sort of partisan demands. Um, and so in the case of Michigan, it was about the mask mandates. In the case of the insurrection, it was about the outcome of the election that was seen by everybody who audited votes. I live in the state of Wisconsin. We've been audited and audited and audited. Um, and we still have auditing going on um, that you know, that the election, as we heard this morning, was also one that the outcome was clear. But the move, the insurrection, was to change that outcome. And if that's, you know, if, if there is no consequence, I think, to that move, then it is inevitable. And I don't think it necessarily lands only on the faculty at universities <laughs> to try to stop it from happening again. I mean, that's a lot of weight on us. <laughs> and I'm not sure I could stand up to that. I understand the, the sort of argument, but it's, it's a lot of pressure um, and that I don't necessarily know if I can, I can manage myself. He's in an English department, so. <laughs> I would just chime in. I, I think absolutely it's too, too much pressure, but, but I think one thing, um, two, two resources to point out, maybe some of you know about them. If not, you can look them up in, in part of the curricular advocacy. The first is the American Academy of Arts and Science issued a report about two years ago called Our Common Purpose. Um, and it was bipartisan. It wasn't nonpartisan, but it was bipartisan. And just thinking about that phrase, common purpose, right? I think that's another way to maybe engage um, many without putting up an initial roadblock that comes with some of these other terms, alas. And then the second resource is Educating for American Democracy, which uh, is uh, NEH, National uh, Endowment for Humanities, and the Education Department. And it's intriguing because it's trying to bridge K through 12 educators with college professors, particularly in history and civics. I'm left out as an English professor, but I've been involved in that project uh, from, the, from the outside looking in, but it's been very inspiring to see that conversation, um, just as you pointed out at the early panel. I mean, one of the most amazing things is the disinvestment in civics education. It's like five cents on average for civics versus $50 per student on STEM. And so uh, 
I think those are those are two things that are inspiring. And I know many of you are involved in campus uh, community engagement centers. And I think that's, I taught at Carnegie Mellon for a year and there was a deliberative democracy institute that ran a deliberation on campus every year to discuss a local issue. I think that's another thing to consider too is how to look at these questions, which seems so overwhelming when you view them from the national lens, right? But if you look at them more locally where you are, they're, they're much more tractable or they, they can be much more tractable. Um, and that's, I mean, that's sort of the way the US democracy was designed. We've forgotten, we've forgotten that. Um, thank you for sharing your thoughts today. I, I don't study American politics, but I do study trust in government in another diverse democracy, which is India. And it was something I'm finding across most diverse contexts, democratic contexts at least, is this weaponization of nostalgia. It's not something we see uniquely happening in the United States, it's actually a global phenomenon. And at least in the context that I'm more familiar with, we find that nostalgia sort of always seems to be pushing up against the truth. It keeps taking space away and you know and because of its emotional nature you find it hard to actually talk to people and talk about the, the, the truth the capital t uh, that is the case because there's footage there's something else there's evidence and then there's nostalgia and i was just wondering from your research from the archival work that you all have done um how do we like begin to have those conversations when we're up against such highly charged environments and especially in context, diverse contexts where people aren't just arguing um, about a particular event, but they're arguing the very history of, you know, like a, a religion or, a, or ethnic group, perhaps. It's not just one event, it's sort of the entire construction of someone's identity. I guess that's too. <laughs> um, thank you for the question. And I would, I'm gonna add another French into your sort of structure here, because I also think that not only do you have sort of the, the nostalgic yearning, which is not necessarily based in fact, running up against the truth or the facts, but you also have the, um, the flattening and, and sort of um, uh, glorification of heroic events in film and television. Um, and this is particularly acute, and, and I'm not as versed in languages, productions in languages that I do not speak, but if you look at just the British and the American of, say, movies about World War II, shall we say, um, and what is presented in, those, in that space is a heroic conquering, right? Um, and so because we are now moving to the point where the veterans and those who experience those wars are leaving us that what we have left are you know movies by great filmmakers that dramatize this kind of heroic nostalgia um, that mm -hmm. makes it even more difficult because the images we carry around in our minds are ones that are not based in the facts but are the ones that are based in these narrative constructions of what happened. Um, and I think that that is something that has also been integrated into politics in such a way. And you have people making references to these kinds of productions when they're running for office. Um, we had a lot of people who were asking for their Jack Bauer when they were running for president some years back um, from 24. Um, and again, that's, you know, again, it's kind of heroics, but it's not based in reality. Um, but, you know, we do have so many of these heroic tales of something that actually happened that have now taken places in our brains um, and have to some degree replaced the actual understanding. And that I think is making it even more useful to use nostalgia as a political tool because mm -hmm. you can make reference to that and everybody understands it in a very flattened way um, and so i think it's more difficult and it's also treading on nationalism in a more acute way I have just one, one thing to add to to make things even more complicated is uh fact as a word and faction are etymologically 
they, they descend from the same term, right? So there's a really challenging essay by Russ Castronovo called Facts, Factions, and Anachronism. And it's a reminder that, you know, yes, we need to be seeking after fact, but I think it's not, I think, you know, the, the alternative fact comment from a few years ago sort of blew up, rightly so, but I think it missed a point that facts are in contestation, right? In a democracy, you arrive at what is fact, what is true through a public verifiability, right? And I think that's that's the important thing to get at is what we're struggling with right now, I think is public accessibility, what we can verify and hold in common, right? And so I think that the, the fact doesn't exist separately from the social that a fact. Libby, did you wanna jump in? Um, I mean, I agree with what um, both of my colleagues have already said, and especially with the claim that, you know, part of what is being debated is both the, you know, the idea that um, truths have to be publicly verified, but even the very sense of what is a public, who belongs to a public, what is in common is itself completely um, not under attack, but there's, you know, we can't even kind of commonly agree on what a public is and who belongs there. And I think that's just exacerbates the problems that both um, Lily and Greg were discussing. So I, I've been thinking through about all three of your wonderful presentations. I want to thank you for, for being here and being so marvelously thought provocative. And and I'm going to try and bring together this notion of nostalgia and these notions of freedom, right? So it, Libby, when I think of back on conversations that I've had with students or with you know, members of the community um, about free speech, they seem to think that that means that they should not be held accountable for the impact of their words, right? It was like, well, it was my freedom to say that. And I was like, well, yeah, but that doesn't mean you're not going to get pushback or that people aren't going to condemn you or that there's not going to be social ostracization, um, that, that all of those factors, that there seems to be a desire to be free from consequence, that freedom means free from consequence. So to bring that into nostalgia, I'm very interested, Lily, in your perspective, perspective on whether or not some of this nostalgia is fueled by a desire to go back to a time when certain parts of the population were not just dominant, but were free from consequence, right? They were free from consequences of domestic violence, child abuse, sexual assault, sexual harassment, murder of, you know, peaceably assembling or, you know, joggers going through a neighborhood that was not familiar, you know, and, and, and to be able to get away with what we would now condemn as horrific acts. So I, I, I'm interested in both of your comments. Great, I mean, I, I agree with everything that you just said. I do think part of the language of free speech these days is a, free, a freedom to not be accountable for, from, for one's words, to not have to reckon with the ways in which words can make people vulnerable or make them more harmed, to, to kind of be free from that consequence, as you said. And I think when people argue about cancel culture, what they're actually confusing is being held accountable for their words with being canceled, right? Which are two very different things that get conflated in a lot of our public discourse. But I would also agree that accountability extends beyond questions of free of speech, that accountability is often about being, or, or, or there are notions of freedom that are harmful where they're like, I am free to do what I want, which includes being able to dominate other people against their will, or I am free to allow my individual freedom to harm other people and to not have to grapple with those consequences. I do think we can call that nostalgia, but it's also a truth claim of how freedom has operated at various moments in the past. And then perhaps the present moment when a lot of those claims for non-accountability are being challenged across sectors of social, political, and economic life, when they're being pushed back against that then the claim for making America great again, or the nostalgia in that is, is a nostalgia for non-accountability. I would agree completely with my colleague, Libby Anchor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I would say, I mean, like just, just the example of the blowing up of the Me Too movement, right? 
what what is me too me too is actually holding people accountable for behavior in cases illegal um, that they were not held accountable before in in particular really actual ways um, and and it was also the use of power right that people had were in positions of power and they used that power um, to get sex of some kind oftentimes from people who had less power than they did. And so if we graft that sort of whole notion onto this question of displaced power, who had it and who's losing it? I think, I mean, your, your comments about toxic masculinity overlap in absolutely in this regard. And I think that the nostalgia is in fact for that former notion of a time when yes, certain people had definitely more freedom than other people to do things that they didn't necessarily suffer the consequences of, that we would say what they were doing was not in fact a freedom, but a lack of accountability um, for acts that were wrong or unjust or unfair or illegal. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, nostalgia is a big term, um, but that's also why I think that it is something that is used in politics in this regard, because it can cover up um, spaces and concepts that we would otherwise sort of say like, no, you shouldn't have been doing that. That was racist. And now we're gonna call you out on it. Um, or that was actually sexual harassment and nobody should have to you know, suffer through that. And it's because you were in a position of power. All right, seeing no other questions, I will pose our last before we um, wrap up, if that's okay. And I want to take this international because we're seeing kind of this. Uh, and we've talked about that in the domestic context in terms of, um, right, and from the perspective of participants, from the perspective of U.S. history, rhetoric, the rhetoric of nostalgia, um, but there might be some other relevant perspectives um, that are global or international, right? Um, thinking about um, both how January 6th as an event was seen from an international or global perspective, from India, from Cameroon, right? So from other places around the world and how that narrative is being told from without, without these, the borders of the US. Um, so just asking for your thoughts on that, but also how the narrative inside the US has been influenced. We can think of, um, right, a National Intelligence 2021 Council report about Moscow's strategy during the election cycle, right, which was to use proxies linked to Russian intelligence to push influence narratives. So this whole thing that we're facing in terms of where these narratives are coming from, right? From our own past and our domestic history, um, right? From the ways in which we fantasize and want to live in a fantasy about what that perhaps, um, and perhaps um, how we would like to use our freedom to dominate or free others and be free with others. Um, but just trying to think about how January 6th, right? Uh, plays into external narratives and how our own domestic narratives are Perspectives. Any last words to wrap us up on that note for the panel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a huge question. I, I yeah, um, I, I don't really. This is. I'm still learning about reconstruction. I think you know, Carrie, your point about um, Professor Jeffrey's comments. It's like I can't recall any of my education about reconstruction as domestic question. And I mean that with much love to all of my wonderful teachers. I don't think it was their sense. So, you know, learning about that era of our history afresh, um, there certainly, I mean, there was a, there was a global awareness, right? Um, uh, and, a, and a lot of it was thinking about international norms and international law. Um, and, you know, the, the project I mentioned a moment ago, Educating for American Democracy, it's, you know, this idea of how do you create a curriculum for a domestic citizenry that is aware of the world while still keeping the fact that we are, or at least we used to believe that education was about 
citizenship preparation, right? And we sort of lost that. And so the, the solution they came up with, and this is my way of getting out of answering this question, because I don't really have, um, I just, I'm, I'm ignorant, and I mean that, you know, I'm chastising myself, but they think about this idea of what it means to be America within the larger fairness of the world, right? And thinking about other democracies. Um, and this idea of what is publicly verifiable and who is included in that public, I think is something um, that domestic question can be fruitfully thought through this global lens, even international bodies, right? Mm -hmm. Levy, you want to go? Um, sure. I mean, first I'll just say about reconstruction. I like, I also did not learn about reconstruction until college, but my fourth grader in DC public schools is learning about it this year. So, you know, I feel like there are, you know, shifts in, in how we educate in a kind, you know, in, in a different context, which is also part of what we see people pushing up against. Um, but, you know, I'm not sure if this answers the question entirely, but I do say like within the realm of freedom, I mean, on the one hand, we see the idea of freedom as a freedom to kind of control or dominate or to, to insist on one's way, even against the will of the majority. Um, like, you know, we see that in the Freedom Convoy, for instance, in Canada. I mean, we see these ideas, ways of talking that circulate transnationally. And many of the ideas of freedom that are commonly used in the U.S., even freedoms that justify harm, are not like sui generis to the U.S. They often themselves come out of, you know, past contexts, British contexts. We can think of both Locke and Mill, who articulated, you know, beautiful versions of freedom that themselves also justified harm. Right, like John Stuart Mill, who argued that freedom is about individual sovereignty, and then five lines later argued, except for people who are colonized, they deserve to be despotic until we can teach them to be free. Right, these kind of ways of thinking through freedom and violence are significantly broader than the U.S., even as they circulate within particularity and particular national contexts at different times, that then track once again and travel transnationally. So I do think while what we might be seeing in January 6th was a particular iteration of a kind of violence of freedom, I don't think that it, it, it has any unique or exceptional purchase on the terms. And I do think we can see this as part of transnational and global phenomena, both past and present. I, I would just um, sort of say this in, in context of understanding the, narr the narrative of the United States and the perception of the United States that, that, that the U.S. has both projected itself and to some degree, particularly in the Western world um, of the city on the hill, the shining example that, um, that comes out of our Puritan founding um, that also obscures our Jamestown founding. Um, but that, you know, that was also rearticulated throughout the Cold War and particularly by Ronald Reagan, that the United States, you know, is this this example of um, understanding democracy in a republic. Um, and then you have what happened on January 6th as a very confusing um, sort of projection of Americans messing with their process. Uh, and it, there is an expectation these days also with regard to the US use of violence. Um, that I hear regularly from colleagues and friends um, in many other countries, um, but that the, the, what happened on January 6th doesn't square with the concept of the United States as a beacon for democracy, um, in part because the democratic process, which is what the elections are supposed to do, they replace the revolutions, right? my theorist friends. Um, and, and so if you have the elections that are supposed to stop the bloodletting that happened, then you have bloodletting that happens with regard to the election. It doesn't seem to work in terms of what we understand sort of the democracy to be. And I think that's also where there is um, not just, I, I wouldn't say confusion, but the, the examples do not connect. And I think that's part of the sort of international response and reaction to what happened on January 6th. Well, thank you all. And the parts did connect hopefully for everyone at this event of all of our wonderful panelists from this morning, our special notes who joined us um, and our panelists on this afternoon panel. I know
a difference in our, regular, our original schedule, but we're glad that you stuck with us. And I'd like to just thank all of today's speakers and co-sponsors once again, important discussion. Hope that it continues. And I'd like to give a special and personal thanks to Dr. Lauren Bell, who brought many, uh, who brought us all together through this idea to have this event, um, as well as Dr. Whaley. Possible. Um, As we conclude today, I hope the discussion about the causes and consequences of January 6th for our democracy won't stop, especially in light of the um, and that's been going on for over a decade. So especially highlighted by the Russian invasion of an independent democratic state like Ukraine. And it's important that we keep public discussion about democracy and about this event that affected democracy January 6th. Um, in our attention, right, and keep it vibrant. And that is happening in this room. Uh, what civic education, got a lot of ideas on the table today, right? So we talked about anti-racism and, and diversity because we talked about nonpartisan thinking, right? We talked about civic education in terms of political structures, right? Civic education should be about how does government actually work? Um, critical thinking. Does it mean that we need to be thinking about teaching how to think in terms of analyzing narratives? What these three panelists all just did. They took a narrative, they analyzed it, they broke it down and talked about information literacy, right? Which you're all learning about. Did I miss anything? <laughs> Civic education. So we just and brought all understanding shared understanding of norms. Yes, Kevin's point from this morning, right? Um, so we have a whole list of things that we put together at this event, which was put together by these great people here today. So um, let's keep the conversation going and thank you all again and to our speakers and sponsors.